he is in. He has just joined us now. Alexander has just joined us. Alessandro Pisanti. Yes, yes, Alexander. Yeah, yeah, he's just joined us now. Welcome, Alexandra. Okay, I hope that Alessandro Pisanti knows that he must join us now. Okay, he has joined and just left. So uh, just a second, uh, he has joined and uh, left. So we'll just think he's joining us shortly, but he was in then just left shortly. Right I'm not sure why. Maybe a few usual technical problems. Okay, it's well. And uh, Vin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you. Okay. As soon as Alessandro is with us, he is here. Okay, great. Okay, let's let's start, please. Uh, yes, Alexandra. Okay. As you're setting up here, so just uh, welcome everyone to this, to the session today, this morning, this afternoon. I'm not presenting here. I'm trying to silence something in my computer. And at Facebook, we often ask to balance competing equities. Sometimes it's best to from the safety or security perspective. This is the best for privacy or free expression. So we work with experts across society to strike the right balance. We don't always get it right, but we try to be fair. Alessandro, your mic seems to be open. Can we start? Uh, yes, I am to, to close the window that has the sound. Okay. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, okay, thank you very much for coming to this session at the IGF 2020. I am Sebastian Bachelet, uh, Chair of Euralo, member of the Isaac France, and uh, um, but here as a host uh, to this. Um, meeting of the Dynamic Coalition on uh, um, Core Internet Values. And uh, we will talk about uh, uh, crisis management and renewal. Um, as you know, Internet is uh, uh, the lifeline of all communication during this quite strange and difficult period all around the world. But it's tried to keep us connected to be able to do things that we were used to do uh, by uh, meeting people or uh, sometime with internet too, but also with um, uh, with some face-to-face -face meeting. And I think it's one of the core value I, I miss the most, it's to be able to meet with other people and meet with you. Um, and, and the questions we will raise during this uh, session, it's, uh, is there any stress on core internet values during the crisis? And would there be a greater realization on the significance of this value post-crisis? And um, I, I will now give the floor to Olivier for, I hope that I didn't hit your introduction, Olivier, but I'm sure you will find something else to say if I have done it. Olivier, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and I hope that everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm really uh, delighted to uh, see you all uh, come to the session. Thank you for uh, agreeing to uh, chair this session, Sebastian. It's uh, the first in a number of years that I'm not having to chair myself, so I'm pretty happy to be able to actually take on a different angle. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, annual meeting, uh, since the last uh, meeting uh, last year, that seems to be a world away from what we're living at the moment. Uh, there was another uh, uh, meeting, or virtual meeting, that took place at the Eurodig European Dialogue in Internet Governance. It was a pre-event, and in the agenda page, you'll see references. And one of the references is the, this link to the Internet successes and failures to support a world living under COVID-19 lockdown. So a lot of the discussions might 
um, or some of the discussions might follow up from the uh, discussions we had uh, back then. The world is still in the middle of this pandemic, and at, on top of that, we have a significant uh, uh, trouble uh, with regards to the economy. Um, the world's economies have slowed down to, to a, a great extent, and on top of that, some places in the world now have another wave, a second wave of uh, COVID-19. But lessons have been learned in many cases, and of course, our thinking has come down the line uh, a little bit. So today's uh, discussion is going to be a follow-up on the 6F framework with Alejandro Pizanti taking us through this, and then a, a good discussion after that. And then a follow-up on the COVID-19 pandemic uh, consequences and on this occasion we'll have Olga Makarova uh, from Mobile uh, Telesystems MTS, the biggest mobile uh, provider in Russia. Uh, not the usual suspects and it'll be really interesting to hear what the consequences are on the technical side of things, on the network, and whether that uh, then has an impact with Sebastian being able to, to speak to us about the impact in other countries and, and the link to internet governance. Right. Anyway, without any further ado, we have a very short amount of time for some really interesting discussions. If we want to have some time to also present the statement on excessive internet controls in the last part of this meeting, uh, we need to get on with things right away. So I guess uh, I'll hand the floor back to Sebastian, who is going to be taking us through the the whole uh, discussion today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Olivier, for this uh, introduction. And I guess uh, you get a sense of the agenda for today. And yes, we have a lot to do in uh, one and a half hours. Therefore, I will ask uh, Alessandro if you can take us through the 6F framework and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Alessandro, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mexico City, 4.30 a.m. Uh, I'm very glad to take part uh, in this meeting as I, as I was also very glad to contribute to its organization. Uh, thanks, uh, Sebastian, and Olivier, Shiva, uh, Olga, and all others who are making this possible. Uh, very briefly, I will be speaking about the uh, 6F framework, which we have already discussed last year. Uh, to take you briefly through it, the idea is uh, to have a design where we have uh, the ability to uh, understand uh, things that have uh, some factors uh, or origins in common between what you see online and what you see offline. Uh, we often see that uh, the internet is blamed for every evil and we also have been very optimistic and i continue to be very optimistic uh, about uh, the good that it can bring so very briefly we are reminded that there are a set of internet design principles and goals uh, which are the layered architecture and packet switching which are not unique to the internet but the ip protocol does the packet switching uh, and as it extends globally it is uh, uh, a principle now for the global internet. Uh, we have the internet was designed for fallibility, for the, the possibility of failure, and therefore for best effort. Uh, in interviews with Vint uh, Cerf, which I already described last year and which uh, went further this year, uh, I, I found out with him that he and uh, Bob Kant uh, were designing networks with this principle in mind, first of all, because it was for radio. You must remember that it was for the GDPR. Then we have the very well known and generally accepted as that basic principle of the internet, which is interoperability, uh, openness in, in many senses, but basically that whatever you plug in, if it's compatible and doesn't break the net, has to be able to start working. Uh, end to end or the thumb network, smart edge or intelligence at the edge, which gives us uh, consequences like network neutrality, the decentralization of decisions and of networks and network management. Uh, these are design principles. Then there's a design goal for scalability. The network was designed initially and tested for very small networks, for very small interconnections of networks. Uh, and uh, basically with the same protocol, with IPv4 in particular, it has scaled up to the zillions of people that we see connected today. 
and uh, it, it, its openness and the openness in its management and design have also given us IPv6 and uh, much, much larger scale ability. Universality in many senses, again, uh, universal reach, uh, no recognition of borders in, in the design, or no demand for recognition of borders in the design, and all these together bring us permissionless innovation. That has been uh, given, that has given rise to the flowering of the internet for the, for the world, the, 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 the zillions and zillions of people, devices, uh, software types uh, and services that now run on the internet uh, stem from these uh, principles. And we must remember also that there is a sequence to them. Uh, if you try, for example, to have a network that's not interoperable for the sake of security, uh, you are actually losing the internet and you're having something else. Uh, we uh, now go to uh, a consequence, let's say, a, a further abstraction uh, of these principles, which is what happens when you try to map uh, some known behavior uh, offline or previous, let's say, uh, uh, this is already 50 years ago among humans or their organizations, uh, mm -hmm. like governments or companies or associations, and uh, what you see online. Um, I will use two examples very briefly, I mean, as, as, as I go down the list, uh, which are well known to, to all, all those in this meeting, which are phishing and Wikipedia when needed for anchoring. The method, let's say, comes from when you ask someone to remove the internet from their reasoning. When they tell you phishing is horrible, it's right, it's all over the place, there are criminals all over the internet, uh, you tell them, you know, there's criminals all over the world anyway, and they are doing things like phishing, for example, uh, there's a guy who took money off uh, a friend's mother a year and a half ago uh, by going to her office and telling her he was coming from the bank. I and mean, this was a physical encounter. And the guy has a piece of paper on him, which has the logotypes of several banks, and tells her, you know, we're acting on security. Our bank is very concerned with security. And you should uh, please sign here so I can renew your passwords. And of course, he took her money. Uh, what happens when this guy goes online? It has massive scale. And instead of visiting 30 people and maybe being successful with one every day, now he can visit 50 million people with emails and wait for the for the gullible ones to to fall. Uh, he's hiding behind the, the lack that, as as you saw in the previous uh, slide, the internet itself has no identity layer. The most of identity that you get on the internet layer in the model is uh, an IP address. Uh, you don't get, I mean, if you go to the MAC address, you'll say that, you know, hey, devices have MAC addresses. Well, if it doesn't identify the user, it identifies a, 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 a server in the device. It doesn't even identify the device. And uh, if you say, well, no, banks are requiring you for user IDs and passwords and two-factor uh, uh, authentications, this is in the layer above and outside, on the edge, not on the internet. So, this anonymity is very useful to hide uh, activists that are protesting against uh, political regimes. They are very useful for uh, education and sexual and reproductive behavior uh, in cultures like those from uh, uh, religious or other uh, principles who actually block women from their from this knowledge and empower them for autonomy in their lives. You have transjurisdictional effects, the universal reach of the internet, the fact that an IP address is assigned uh, without any uh, recognition of borders in the design uh, allows people to move along or across the network. So it gives you uh, Wikipedia uh, for repressive regimes from, uh, from abroad, and it gives you, of course, the uh, border jumping or the jurisdiction jumping that makes the fishing so easy. We lower barriers in two senses, at least it's uh, an organizational or action barrier, which is lowered uh, when you don't have to set up a physical company, a workshop, a physical uh, store, instead of being able to set up uh, an online store. And you have a barrier lowering in that in this sense now, it is much easier for people to enter markets. So you have uh, small uh, landholders being able to sell agricultural produce. You have uh, artisans in indigenous countries being able to sell uh, their, uh, their, their, their goods online, maybe through aggregators, which are also easier to set up and so on, you have access to markets. And you have friction reduction in two senses. One of them is the economics sense, where you have uh, perfect information markets, uh, where people know the prices, people uh, do away with intermediaries and so on. And you have friction reduction in the UX or user experience sense, 
where you have a one button shopping and uh, uh, citizens, for example, now expect one click uh, payment for their taxes or one click starting of litigation as much as we are used to one click shopping in, uh, in, in, in online stores. And we have a very complex set of uh, effects on memory and forgetting. We now have a massive memory and we also have the possibility of deleting or not being able to access because of changes of format, for example, or because something was encrypted by law 25 years ago and now we don't have the, the keys and maybe we can uh, make a brute force attack on it, but maybe it's not legal. So we have a, a, a complex set of memory and forgetting effects. Uh, this is the framework. I hope the applications have been uh, uh, very clear and they have a, another presentation for when we go to the uh, the point on the effects of COVID, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to separate this as, as the agenda has been set up for this group. So I'm uh, putting forward this success framework. It's a successor to the 60s of John C. Lee Brown, which was like disintermediation, delocalization, and so on. I think it is more general, and I think it allows us to understand or to ask questions to things. Uh, if we ask, for example, for the COVID response, one of the things that we get is mass scaling of the information, we get mass scaling and a, a lot of barrier lowering and friction reduction to the scientific collaborations that gave us rise to, for example, the sequencing on the, of, the of the virus, their variants, uh, all the immunology effects about how it acts and how antibodies work. Uh, and uh, we also have, of course, a negative effect on this friction reduction, which is the spread of misinformation uh, in a mass scale, uh, sometimes behind anonymity, sometimes crossing borders, and so on. So this is a useful framework. And the COVID-19 epidemic has given us a new way to look at some of these uh, specific phenomena. And then also think, what are the challenges and maybe what are the solutions? The challenge of this information, for example, is this mass scaling, it's border crossing and so on. So we have to counter it with something that scales as well, which we haven't found, by the way. Uh, but we know that uh, whatever solution we, we, we find, we'll need this scaling and so on. Again, I'll leave it at that so there's more time for discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Um, the, the goal of this uh, those session or this meeting today is to, to have as much as possible some exchanges. Um, therefore, um, I know that um, Vint, you put some question and in, in the right place in the Q and A question place. Uh, but um, may I ask you if you wish to uh, take the floor? We we need to upgrade you, but uh, I hope that it will be done soon and that uh, if you wish, you can talk and not just uh, send a message. Please, can you upgrade Vint self and? Uh, Give me, give him the floor. Uh, it, it would be easier yes. if uh, he the host just... uh, promotes you as co-host. Okay, he's oh, I promote as co-host. Okay, no problem. Let me do that. Then also, is he can now speak. Vince, Vince, uh, Vince Saf can now speak. Actually, let me. <laughs> okay, Vint, uh, please take the floor, and we are very honored to have you today in this uh, session. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't seem to uh, to be able to get my uh, video camera uh, going. I know it works because I tested it. Um, so apparently I need permission for that. But uh, setting that aside, um, I would uh, the question I was going to ask Alex has to do with permissionless innovation, which uh, I am you know uh, much uh, in favor of. But as I listen uh, and see the various problems that are arising in this online environment, I do get worried about how we temper uh, permissionless innovation so that we can do something about harmful behaviors. Uh, and in fact, uh, as, uh, as Alex was, uh, was speaking, I was writing notes to myself uh, about the, uh, the fact that the internet is distance erasing and so if you think a little bit about um, co-location, for example, which is often necessary for some of the real world harms that, uh, that Alex was referring to, the internet permits these harms to occur at a distance because we've all said the internet erases distance and so it does. It creates juxtaposition where there would not be juxtaposition in the real world, but it creates juxtaposition in the online world. 
And so I'm beginning to think that uh, our, uh, uh, our uh, thought has to be uh, related to the transformational elements that the internet has demonstrated and figure out uh, how we apply law enforcement or other kinds of norms uh, in a very different environment than the real world. Uh, I do like very much though, uh, Alex's point that looking at the real world uh, legal framework uh, is an important clue uh, for, for us as we try to figure out how do we uh, put guardrails in place in the online environment. So thanks very much for, uh, for letting me uh, intervene. Uh, I'm looking forward. Thank you very much, uh, Vint, and uh, I, I guess I need to learn how to, I wanted to promote you, uh, but you just, you know, now we can see you with your video and, and that's, uh, that will be good for the next time you will, you will talk. Thank you very much, uh, Vint. Well, and, and, uh, thank you for showing everyone that I did dress for this meeting. Yeah, but, but we, we, we were sure about that, Vint. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> de definitely. Uh, uh, Alessandro, you want to um, take uh, this this question or this comment and and say something, or we? I ask uh, very briefly, I think that what we see is that uh, we have no hope of uh, solving thing, certain you know key problems like the ones of polarization or hate speech or fraud and crime on the internet uh, by internet means only. They are always humans doing stuff humans or companies or governments doing stuff on the internet. So we may be able to use the internet as a tool, but we have to look at solving this human problem. I'm always reminded uh, of an, an old IGF, and now, now old IGF, uh, the one in Vilnius, where a law enforcement official from mine, I don't remember if it was uh, Australia or somewhere, or, or, or Belgium, uh, was uh, telling how they, they, it was a very good cyber crime session, and law enforcement officials were very proud telling us how they were using now different techniques to spot and uh, identify and put into jail, actually, some criminals. So they had this guy who was selling sexual activity online uh, on demand, uh, and they were able to spot him and uh, pick him up. But what you are not going to fix is that he was having sex with his, his two daughters, for sure. Uh, that's not an internet problem. And, and, and that's what I want to, 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 to focus on, that we have to use the internet maybe as a tool to spot these criminals, maybe to educate, but we're not going to change people's minds internally with the, the psychology uh, by internet means alone. Thanks. Thank you, Alessandro. Any other comments, questions? Please feel free to use this time for that. Uh, it's really your turn to, to talk. So this, it's Vind again. Uh, I was Good. going to say that we need to use human solutions to solve human problems, that technology is not going to solve them for us. And I think Alex makes that point very, very well. Thank you, Vint. Thank you, Alexander. Um, if there are no other question or, or, or comments, uh, maybe Olivier, okay. you want? Okay, go ahead, Olivier. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. Olivier Clefan of Lost Speaking. I don't know whether you can actually see the participants list, but I have put my hand up, so I didn't quite know whether. No, it's because there are two lists, and I have to figure out which list I have to go. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the wonders of technology. I was going to ask uh, Alejandro, uh, as um, this is an ongoing work, and of course, he had already presented it at the last uh, of our meetings, and really it's kind of you know easing into the next stage here. What has COVID-19 changed in this framework? It, uh, you know, it, has it had a massive impact uh, or is it still, um, you know, is, is there no, no change to it as such? Um, I have uh, found that uh, COVID-19 has, uh, well, I think we all find that COVID-19 has been a massive test for the internet in many ways. Uh, I, I sort of uh, have a second presentation for this. Uh, but uh, what we, uh, what I'm presenting also at the uh, dynamic coalition on network neutrality is uh, an analysis of the impact on internet openness. What we see, for example, there is that the massive scaling effects uh, have found some boundaries 
they have been uh, the massive scaling under COVID was put under a really serious test. Uh, the core of the internet has held up very well uh, in this scaling. Uh, there were needs more like it, it wasn't a protocol issue, but an operational issue. For example, when European operators came together uh, with companies like Netflix and other uh, streaming services or Alphabet's, Google's, uh, YouTube services in order to demand and to agree to have lower bandwidth requirements. So, for example, Netflix was showing at lower resolution in order to reduce the bit rates and so uh, avoid congestion at the core. Uh, the scalability has been very dramatically tested at the edge. There in countries like mine in Mexico, and the reports are more or less the same in all of Latin America and South Asia. Uh, and I have not gotten details in African countries, but we find that 40% of the population doesn't actually have access at the edge. And we have to remedy that when we have uh, brought all our schooling, for example, online. Uh, this, uh, Traffic increases measured at the IXPs shows the value of IXPs for scalability, by the way. So we're looking again at factor one mass scaling. Uh, international cross jurisdictional traffic uh, is there, and IXPs are a very good way of scaling the network. And they are reporting increases of traffic of 40%. Uh, uh, almost everybody I know, including my students at the university, has had to spend extra money on getting a better connection, whether it be an increase in bandwidth or a change of technology to get fiber so that the latencies are diminished. But once was a house that uh, maybe has a heavy use of internet for Netflix at night, now has uh, three people at school and two people at work uh, at the same time with very high demands for latency because we went all on video. Uh, so these are, are, are the ways that I'm, I'm using the framework and by using it and testing it. And up to now, it seems that these six factors are pretty good. Uh, we have uh, things like security and so on, which are higher layer. So I'm not uh, addressing them within the, the framework. But sorry, as I said last year, and I mean, the reason to continue this work and to offer it as a, as, as, as a tool for others is to see whether these uh, six factors have the ability first to be complete that we describe reasonably well this matching between human and, uh, and let's say offline or pre-internet and online or post-internet behavior. Uh, so complete, uh, relevant, and useful. These are three uh, things to be tested and that's an, that's an ongoing work which I'm inviting everybody to, to, to share or to, or to invite me to the projects to share. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. We have uh, less than 10 minutes to go. Um, I wanted to um, not to read all the comments, uh, but um, to to read at least one, and uh, it's one from uh, there. There uh, Williams. It. Uh, I was wondering about the fact that originally the internet was based on the concept of freedom of the individual, but COVID requires respect for good of the community. Can anyone speak about that? Um, I, I will ask uh, Alessandro if you have some, some comments on that, but uh, be sure that uh, it will be also something we will discuss in the next uh, session. Alessandro, you want to? Thank you very briefly. Um, there's a very beautiful book called Internet Imagineers, which captures the different mindsets that were coming together for the creation of the internet. And I'll leave the floor to Vint after making this very brief statement. It was built for both things. Uh, the more uh, technical, so some of the more technical side uh, was building this for connections, uh, assuming that was assu the computers would be doing a lot of the work and the network would be used for the computers. Uh, whereas another set of uh, people were from in the 1960s already uh, were building the net for human to human collaboration that would be uh, machine assisted. So these both imaginers are there together. And I think Pink has much more to say because he was in that design. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. Sebastian, is it all right to take a moment to respond? Yes, go, go ahead, uh, Vin, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, Alex is right. Uh, the internet was designed as a collaboration among a bunch of engineers in an academic setting. And their ambition was, of course, to share computing resources and knowledge in order to advance the state of the art of computer science and even in artificial intelligence, believe it or not. That was one of the drivers behind uh, the original network's implementation. But as it evolved and eventually spread to the general public, uh, it was clear that um, it was simultaneously a platform in which collaboration could occur and also a platform in which competition could occur. And so we've seen plenty of both uh, in this environment. I like very much the point that was being made or the question that was being asked, what can we do? How can we use the internet to be more collaborative in our response to COVID-19? Uh, it's clear that there's been heavy collaboration in the search for vaccine against the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, and I think also uh, we're seeing uh, efforts uh, to use it uh, to um, overcome the problem of, of uh, lack of proximity. We've not done a really great job of using the internet in the educational settings yet. The tools are not quite right. The teachers don't have the training. The students are often uh, uh, uncooperative uh, or, or outright uh, uh, you know, misbehaving. So we have a lot of work to do to learn how to adapt this technology. Uh, in a way that uh, that makes it more useful. Uh, so I'm still very optimistic that we can do that. Thank you very much, uh, Vint. And I have a request for floor from Marianne uh, Franklin. Please, uh, I guess I give you the possibility to, to speak. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me? Good morning. Yeah, great. Good. Hi. Do we get? Do we get? Uh, as uh, Vint was pointing out, do we get? Uh, I don't need my visual, but if you want my visual, I'm happy for you to share my camera. Yeah, it's it's more complicated because you will be uh, cut by by a few seconds, and then it's better if you go ahead because we are at the end of this. Oh, I see your point. Sorry uh, about yes, that. I just want to uh, just two things. I'm here on behalf of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, as we are uh, close allies with the core internet. Uh, coalition core internet values um, so uh, just want to underscore our support for your uh, efforts in this domain uh, secondly um, COVID and this uh, pandemic is a game changer and it behoves us I think to be even stronger on recognizing that it is a game changer uh, for all sorts of reasons I think Alejandro you mentioned uh, teaching and learning um, it underscores the digital divide on the most banal level, basically the bandwidth package you have, whether your laptop is compatible with the new apps you're required to download by your employer without support or financial uh, students who are living in shared accommodation or have to go to cafes. Um, so it's a game changer in terms of revealing the very sort of prosaic forms of digital divides within um, privileged areas. But on the other hand, just to, to also underscore, I've been amazed at the um, adapt, adaptability and inventiveness of, uh, of this generation of what we call digital natives, of deploying and repurposing and rejigging uh, off the shelf and all sorts of particularly peer-to-peer -peer and open source uh, applications. And so in that sense, there's a lot of hope. Um, I think the real issue is to do with top-down management decisions that are based on ignorance uh, from the point of view of management and top-down or middle management decisions that are based on um, the hard sell that they get from certain large internet providers. So I think um, there's a huge educational outreach dimension that, um, that would perhaps be uh, good to consider from a point of view of cross-dynamic coalition uh, work. We, we've got to realize this is the next, this is the generation that uh, are learning online 100%. My students are in China, Austria, North London, South London, you name it. And if it weren't for these um, applications, we wouldn't be able to do our job and they wouldn't be able to continue their degrees. So the potentials are enormous. So I think the technical expertise is needed to sort of keep the options open. So free and open source, affordable apps that don't force you to have to upgrade your equipment, which I've had to do because of age old, decades old rivalries between large corporates. So that sort of thing, I think core internet values from the technical expertise that you guys bring uh, to the table. It's really important to hear this from technical experts and uh, formative influences in how the infrastructure actually currently operates. 
I think it's been a resilient infrastructure on the whole, but um, yeah, uh, still learning a lot. And I just wanted to sort of endorse uh, your efforts here and hope we can keep the conversation across our sectors and agree to disagree. Variety is the spice of life and the internet isn't a thing. It's a composition of technologies, humans and lots of accidents. <laughs> so that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. If you can briefly comment, uh, Sebastian, very two yeah, seconds. Briefly, well. and we will move on to yeah. the next question. Okay, the, go ahead. The first, uh, one, the first comment is uh, something I often say, uh, quoting someone, an economist from uh, 2008. Uh, the, the, the quote goes, when the tide goes out, you see who went swimming without trunks. And uh, that's what we have seen in COVID. If your company hasn't prepared for teleworking, for let's say, if they didn't have a password-based system for, do, for, for crossing the firewall, from, for, for working from home, and they have to tear it down, or they didn't have the expertise for collaboration, but also the rules. I mean, you, you, in, in many countries, the courts are stopped every type of litigation or, for example, land and uh, royalty purchasing, uh, uh, real property purchasing are stopped because people don't have the offices in place uh, to, to, to work from home. So uh, you can't sell a house uh, or you can't continue litigation. People are stopped in jail because litigation can't go on because the courts are up. So that's one. And the other one, complementary, is the cost of not doing the governments that didn't enact a digital transformation policy or a national digital strategy, now they have made their citizens incur a very high cost. It was expensive to connect. It's been more expensive not to connect. But the expense was, the, the savings was on the government side and now the spending is for the citizens to do. So this is what has been revealed. This is how COVID and the internet have become an X-ray of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And um, uh, thank you for this session and all the question. And uh, I will give now the floor to Olivier to introduce the next session and uh, to share it also. Go ahead, please, Olivier. Thank you very much, Sebastian Olivier Clepin of Long speaking. So now, of course, the next section that we have is regarding the um, the consequences of COVID-19 on core internet values. and. Uh, on this, uh, we had some discussion on this, as I mentioned earlier, for those people that have joined us recently, I see there are a lot more people than at the beginning of the session, our discussion on the internet successes and failure to support a world living under COVID-19 lockdown. There is a link in the agenda that will take you to that wiki page, which then has a link to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the video recording uh, of this session that took place in June. And there we discussed on whether the internet was fit for purpose with all of the things that it's been put through because of COVID-19. Was there a need for a new network? It was quite a heated discussion and we're not going to reiterate it here. But one thing that might have not been totally clear back then is really what were the real, um, the real consequences of, of uh, the, the internet being used differently uh, with more people working at home and a lot more people resorting to tele, teleworking plus games, plus doing all sorts of other things on the internet. And we have the luck and uh, pleasure to have uh, on this occasion, Olga Makarova, who's joining us uh, from Russia from a company called Mobile Telesystems uh, MTS. They are the largest provider of uh, telecommunications, of mobile communications. Uh, so the largest mobile operator, here we go, I'll get it right. Uh, in Russia, and she's got a, some uh, real interesting data there to uh, take us through our, our, our next discussion, which are the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic um, on the internet and, of course, on the core internet values. Over to you, uh, Olga, and I gather you'll, you've yes, got some you. things to share with us. Okay, okay, just a moment. Is it all right? Perfect. Oh, okay. Many thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity uh, to take part in this discussion as a speaker. I'm starting. No one can easily accept changes. Most people are afraid of changes, especially global changes. Changes never come without losses. Alas, we have faced changes. 
COVID-19 had, had already made a huge impact on people's lives and made huge changes in them. It has been proven that spectrum of uh, people's emotion uh, to changes is always the same. Human emotions start with an initial shock. No, it can't be. And end up accepting them. Well, I need to accept the changes and still living in a new way. Just a moment, okay. Modern changes curve, curves define seven major stages in coping with and accepting changes. Shock, denial, frustration, depression, experiment, decision, and integration, left picture. Could each of these stages affect the internet traffic growth and how? To look for answer, let's take a look at picture on the right. The stage of shock and uh, denial probably started in February this year and ended by the April of this year. During this three months, the volume of our backbone internet traffic has grown by 65%. In the same month of uh, last year and the uh, year before, we recorded an increase of no more than 15%. If so, the stages of shock and denial led to a huge increase in video traffic. We saw an over 20% growth in video traffic after the first three weeks of our lockdown. Our lockdown set off in uh, mid-March uh, sorry, this year, and uh, when it started, many people believed that they would be able to return, return to their former life soon. Alas, it didn't happen. We were expecting a new birth in internet traffic in May during the holidays. We, we, we will have a lot of the holidays in May and plenty of people are used to spend this time traveling around the world. The pandemic has made it impossible for people to travel. People had to stay at home, but the internet traffic that was supposed to grow was not. It seems the stage frustration, frustration has changed stage denial. Traffic decreased and was distributed between a large number of resources. Video traffic dropped, dropped significantly. People stopped binge watching video. Social media traffic decreased slightly. Our lockdown ended in June. Today, Today, traffic's volume have uh, returned to those of March this year. We forecast an annual increase in traffic of 60-65% uh, by, by the end of this year. Last year and year before, we saw an annual increase in traffic at the level of 30-35%. We project the traffic growth to double this year. But I am afraid um, COVID-19 has made it nearly impossible to predict our internet traffic growth for next year, as precisely as we used to do. Uh, no one clearly understands all the reasons for the new traffic growth this fall. Perhaps this is the start of a transmission to a new stage experiment. If this is the case, it will be very positive news. But perhaps we have just returned to the beginning of a new change curve caused by, by, the, by second wave of COVID-19. Nobody can give a precise answer whether these two curves meet, if they both really exist, of course, and when. Therefore, we must prepare our networks to for, for, for new challenges. There is some positive news. The pandemic has forced IPv6 traffic to grow faster than ever. Left picture. On the, import, on the importance of being responsible. By, be, be, uh, by uh, mid-May, gamers woke up. Uh, we saw a rise in traffic from various gaming service, services. In mid-May, we suddenly witnessed a short-term significant burst on our T1's connections, right picture. 
Reason for this explosion was the free distribution of game content launched by one global online internet game store. This led to overloading several global CDNs. Traffic from these CDNs was redirected between TS1 network, networks. The redirection did not affect our customer, but uh, some stakeholders all experienced congestion on the ex external connections. This case demonstrates the urgent need for greater responsibility of each stakeholder, especially now. Oh, on the uh, um, possibility of improvement. We had started developing our connectivity much earlier than the pandemic came. By the start of the pandemic, our network had already had stable, diverse, and protected connectivity with plenty of ISPs and content uh, service providers. We received almost 19% of traffic from our private peer-to-peer -peer connections, cash service, Connections from our own resource in sport, in TS music, in TS TV, etc., and those of, of those our customers, of our customers. Uh, the week before the lockdown, we suddenly received a call from one of our major partners. It is one of the uh, most uh, famous search engine in Russia, successfully competing with Google search engine in the Russian market. Right picture. Uh, uh, it proposed to increase the number of connections and improve their protection, despite the almost ideal schemes of our connections. Left picture. What is done uh, is better than perfect. Uh, what is done is better than perfect. But sometimes you need to do better. On quality of service. One of the main, main, main measurement uh, parameters is paid launch time. We measure it for the top 100 websites. By June of this year, we discovered that over 70% of the problems associated with long page load, uh, associated with long page load were, were related to the sites themselves, not our network. We started partnering with content uh, providers to solve problems together. And we managed to improve the quality of service during the pandemic, in spite of the pandemic. Oh, uh, all the benefits of concise and transparent documents. We rely on uh, the network neutrality framework for neg negotiations and agreements. It is a short, concise, and uh, transparent document. It contains only two pages, and everybody can read it. It was developed by uh, the working group of Russian stakeholders, telecoms, content providers, associations, and other, in December uh, 20, uh, 2015. Yeah. We recommend applications by all stakeholders, allow bringing content closer, closer to consumers by establishing direct link between telecoms, nationals, and global content providers, optimizing traffic roads, and creating conditions for, uh, for, 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 for rapid expansions of bandwidth, in particular in the case of a significant growth of internet traffic. Perhaps our regional experience uh, might be interesting to study. In this regard, in this regard, I uh, want to thank all our partner, partners for their contribution in serving traffic during the pandemic. But uh, the development of 5G networks is leading to new changes. And these changes will affect not only telecoms, but all stakeholders. So we should be ready. Thank you for your attention. We can uh, ask uh, your questions by email, email or anyway. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation, Olga. We'll um, follow through immediately with uh, Sebastian. I mean, the, the points you've developed are, are very interesting. There are a number of questions in the chat and the Q&A pod. So okay, okay. you can read those. And I'll hand the floor over to Sebastian for the link to internet governance and to our, our core values. 
Sebastian Bachelet. Thank you very much. Uh, Spasiba Bolshoi Olga. Um, I, I uh, want to talk to you to, to take the other side of the situation. I am an end user and as an end user, what was the situation with COVID-19? And um, uh, Alessandro talked earlier that uh, some people were able to upgrade their network uh, in the place. I am in the middle of Burgundy. It's, it's not a poor country, but it's a place where we don't have a fiber. We have a very small uh, amount of ADSL and, and uh, uh, upgrading, it's, it's not a possibility. Therefore, when uh, people went to work from home, they discovered that, uh, or we discovered that it was quite complicated. Um, as I'm, I am in charge of one uh, local um, uh, organization here to take care of all type of people, uh, helping children, helping uh, uh, senior people and so on and, and all the families. Uh, and, and we put uh, staff to work home and uh, they were unable to work from home because of the question of the bandwidth. When, when the, um, uh, the responsible of the structure went home, she has just a uh, connection with satellite. Therefore, we don't have this possibility. And in the same time, if we look at the uh, information system, we discover that the system was built to be working on the a local network, but not at all to be working uh, from, from outside. Fortunately, just today before we set up a private network, therefore we help part of the work were able to be done from home. And, and it was just good, good coincidence or, or good uh, planning. But uh, the fact that we don't have uh, enough bandwidth, it's a real trouble both from the user side and from the uh, company side. And, and um, we, we have to wait a few years before we will get to some fiber. In the same time, we uh, try to keep with, uh, especially with the uh, senior people who are spread around in the country, uh, how to uh, help them to be connected, to stay connected. And fortunately here again, we have helped 20 of those uh, person to learn about internet, how to use their uh, laptop or how to use their um, phone. And, and we, it was really uh, first time they access and they learn about internet, how to use it. And it was good that we done that the year before because during the uh, situation of lockdown, it was the only way to be able to, to connect. And, and even it was a way they use it to um, make, uh, um, to, 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 to get food from outside and to deliver. And um, uh, that's, that's uh, the experience in a yeah, small village in, in Burgundy. And, and uh, it's, it's where we, we need to take that into account both sides. Uh, yes, Olga shows how the network that she's working with uh, was a, a great tool and was um, helping the people to still work. Um, it's not the case here. Uh, we need to wait either for the fiber or for the 5G, but I hope that it will be something we will be able to, to face. But for the second lockdown, as we are today, we, we have the same trouble, the same question, and I want to take one additional example. Um, my son decided to, no, we, we take him here and, and he used to have a good connection in uh, Paris region and here it's not the case. Therefore he can't do what he was supposed to do, his work. And um, that's a, a problem we, we, we have to take into account. Um, and, and I think that's uh, uh, the same situation in a lot of country, uh, I will say uh, in, in Latin America, in Africa, in, uh, in Asia Pacific, not just uh, because we are in France in so-called developed country, we don't have the same type, type of problem. 
But that's that's an idea I wanted to share with you because when, when uh, um, um, we, we want to have uh, internet as a, a human rights a human right base, it's it's I guess it's important, but it starts by the infrastructure and then how we use it on top of that. But first of all, uh, uh, having a good connection, it's something absolutely necessary. I will stop here, Olivier, uh, just for the sake of time. But if there are questions, I will be happy to answer. Olivier, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for this. Alejandro, you typed a question in the chat for, for Olga. I wonder whether you wanted to uh, say it rather than just reading it from there. Thank you. I was just wondering whether there's seasonality. Uh, these are seasonally adjusted results. That is whether the percentages of growth or decrease in traffic are month to month or compared to the year before. Because for example, if your data are for the summer where school went out, you would expect less traffic from uh, uh, school related activities and more uh, traffic for gaming because the, 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 the young people just have more time left. Uh, anyway, I mean, congratulations for this a great presentation and the point of view from Kubler-Rose was fantastic. I, I loved it. Olga? Could you, be, could, could, you be, could, could you please repeat your question? Yes, uh, the percentage, let's say you say you have a 12% increase in traffic uh, from yes. June to July. Is that, yes. uh, that compared from June 2020 to July 2020, or it's comparing? No, 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 no. In June and July, we have decreased, we have decreased our, yes. we have our traffic decreased. Decreased because. about uh, just a moment, just a moment. Uh, let me. I think um, uh, traffic decreased, uh, decreased of 20, maybe 30, 45 percent. Rather, uh, rather serious. Rather, uh, rather, 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 rather dramatic for traffic, but not, no, no, not, not for us because. Uh, if we, have, for example, if we had uh, uh, traffic, dec tra traffic, uh, tra traffic decreased by uh, June 65 uh, percent, we would uh, have had today uh, tra traffic increase. If we had, if we had, had uh, traffic uh, increase. Uh, yes, um, uh, by June, um, 60, 65%, we, will, uh, we, we would um, uh, have had today a traffic decrease by, I, 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 I can't imagine, I, I am afraid of, uh, uh, of uh, to, I am afraid to, to think about it, about, I think, uh, maybe uh, 100, uh, 20 percent maybe 150 percent it's uh, it's it uh, uh, would have been very dramatic for us yeah Th thank you for this olga alejandro yeah thank you and i would like to to show you a, a slide for for a further comparison where once once others uh, have asked all the other questions okay thanks alejandro um uh, olga i have a question for you regarding the because you know we've seen some vast changes has at any point has the network been in a situation where it could not cope with the change in traffic where the you know you basically saw it and said well um your company said well you know what we're not ready for this sort of thing um and i wonder you know as a typical internet service provider Yes, um, a bit a bit story. When uh, we uh, when we understood that uh, we uh, we were coping with uh, traffic increase, I uh, I decided that uh, that we had been been well done, and uh, I uh, told my technical guys, oh we are, we we had been great, 
we um, had everything very well, but uh, they answered me, we, 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 we were afraid, you are wrong. We, not, uh, we, we are not so clever. We are only very lucky, like, 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 like uh, very lucky, very lucky. Yes, but I do. I, uh, yes, of course, uh, there was uh, some um, uh, participants uh, in our uh, market who um, made troubles during uh, the pandemic, especially uh, in March and especially uh, March and April, especially in uh, March and April, and uh, we got uh, so we received some. Uh, calls for this particip participant um, uh, with um, uh, with um, a proposal to uh, to uh, increase our connections to increase our connections. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you for this, Olga. I'm looking at the chat because I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A. I wonder if. I know there, there are quite a few comments made in the chat. Please, please, Olivia Alejandro Pisanti, there's please a question. Go ahead, by, Alejandro, yeah. There's Maybe. a question by Vint Surf, uh, which is whether our houses, uh, places where we live, will have to change uh, in order for several people to be able to work at the same time. And I'm answering that it's a, a very, very important question. When we have a, I have a, a case among one of my, uh, uh, among my students. Uh, one of them has uh, three brothers, they are all studying at the same time, and their parents are working, and their father is a physical education teacher. So he's teaching people physical education, they have to jump and shout and, and move around, so he has to do a lot of shouting. So he would need a house for himself, for sound isolation. So we'll have to make many, many changes in lighting, soundproofing, and just the ability to spare, share space. And when people live in very small homes, uh, apart, apartment blocks uh, with 65 square meters, uh, that's not a lot of space. You have a, a, a less than two meters uh, on one side of the room. It's basically only a monastery bed, uh, probably with uh, uh, two or three beds piled up. When, when you live in these conditions, you are not, uh, I mean, this, this is another big divide in our society that is highlighted by the by, by, by the COVID epidemic. And uh, if we look at more the, the ways the principles are uh, being challenged, we could see that best effort, for example, has been tested mostly okay, broken at the edge in weaker networks, and major adjustments have been made by the supply, by the providers, like exactly Olga showed us. Uh, what Olga showed us here is exactly the way that major adjustments are made by the operators. It's not only Netflix go low resolution, but for example, asking the gamers to game less and so forth. Interoperability has been working well. Devices have been tested and, uh, and some of them are not working well. Uh, national borders, surveillance, uh, tracking applications have challenged the end to end. We're asking the network to do more. Although the European Union, for example, the operators there, are very happy that the way they manage network neutrality deserves to use end-to-end -end in order to sustain best effort. And we can see something like this, mostly okay, except for the universal reach of uh, the internet. So this is the way I see COVID-19 affecting each of the core principles. And then this is a second framework you can use for, for, for valuable analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you for sharing this. That's. Uh particularly important since it relates directly to the work of this uh, dynamic this coalition. I, I was going to mention actually that the, uh, there might be some room for creation of a dynamic coalition on working from home cohabitation or, or, or something to that extent, since it seems to be that we're not in the, this working from home environment for the short term, but rather more the, the longer term than we currently are in. Um, I'm, I'm seeing more discussion in the chat, but no outright comment. Does anybody else wish to intervene on this? Um, yeah, briefly, Olivier or Maybe Sebastian. Marianne wanted to go yeah. ahead. Yeah, Marianne, go ahead. Yes, uh, Alexandro's point is very important. It's not just the issue around bandwidth. It's the fact that many people are sharing 
uh, their access is based on shared devices. So if a family has a decent laptop or even a decent PC is first of all uh, a presumption rather than a fact. And some people are having to share phones, uh, living in family units. So at home is very much defined by uh, access to equipment and the amount of uh, income you need to be able to buy separate pieces of equipment. And I know this isn't immediately on our radar in this discussion, but it is so crucial. You know, students who have to share the computer because their parents and their sisters or brothers are at, on class at the same time and they don't have enough uh, uh, actual hardware, let alone enough bandwidth coming into the home. And I think we really need to drill down and get a 360 degree uh, picture of of how this actually works at the point of accessing as an individual user who may in fact have to share equipment. We're not all as well off, as, uh, people are not as all as well off as some of us are in terms of those options. I just wanted to add that empirically to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may, Olivier, Sebastian Bachelot is speaking. Go ahead, uh, Sebastian. Yeah, def definitely, we, we, we need to, there are different layers here. The first, oh, I don't know if it's first, but how we, we uh, are connected to, to internet. What are the tools we can use uh, our devices and how we need to share or not to share it. And, and then there is a, how we organize in the, in the house. Uh, and, and the example of Alessandro was quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and, and just to take one example here, my son is uh, working during night. Now he's sleeping in the next room. And then I have to make this conference call. And uh, we, we are in, uh, in trouble because we are not living at the same time, but we are sharing the same house. And uh, fortunately, we don't have problem with space, but, but uh, where the internet is, uh, can't allow to have uh, other places. And, 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 and then we have to add to that how people know about how to use those tools and how we help them to, to learn because it's not, uh, the same thing when you send somebody home and saying now you have to work from home or you have to learn from home that they know how to do it and what are the tools. Now we are all used with Zoom, but Zoom it's quite complicated tool when, when you don't know how to even uh, really use well your, your mouse. Therefore, it's all those um, elements we need to take into account in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Mariana, I think you wanted to answer uh, one of Vince's comments in the Q&A pod. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. I was just thinking, can we also fact, um, Vince talking about the economics and Roberto is talking about the laws of physics, totally get you there. But there's cultural, there are cultural aspects as well. Um, and and the, the COVID crisis and the need for us to be online as individuals, but also as communities or as classes or as groups, um, is bringing to the fore the cultural and also the psycho-emotional dimensions to how people, communities, groups, family members, extended families, presume that they can use this equipment. And I think that would make more powerful this discussion to remember the cultural aspect. There are different ways of using these, uh, these portals and these devices. And um, I'm reminded of my privilege when my students knock on my door and say, I'm sorry, but I just can't get to class. I can't actually get to the computer. You know, it's it's my dad's using it, say, for instance, Sebastian, <laughs> and he's got to work. These sorts of things are very subtle, but they're very concrete in their consequences. So point taken, Vincent Pinter and Roberto, but just wanted to add the cultural uh, aspect as part of our empirical uh, data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. And I think Sebastian Subramanian Mutasami wanted to close off on the topic because time is going fast. Shiva? You might be muted. Yeah, there you go. You're still muted. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I I just wanted to recount or uh, recount uh, some of the pertinent observations made by participants in our past sessions. In particular, we had a session uh, two years ago where uh, Matthew Sears was uh, saying uh, he wanted to apply the notion of freedom from harm to core internet values. And he was observing that uh, 
the core internet values should not be harmed and uh, here we are in an age of uh, pandemic uh, quite a lot of values pertaining uh, to uh, the core values uh, including freedom of expression or uh, somewhat uh, compromised as a matter of necessity so uh, the question that is uh, to be raised at this point of time is uh, uh, how temporary or uh, these uh, regulatory measures and so uh, that is uh, what uh, is uh, pertinent at this point uh, another participant tashiana was saying that uh, a new central layer or uh, a center of control must never be created and it appears that uh, during this pandemic uh, due to necessity a uh, certain degree of uh, regulatory control uh, is being put in place and that also should be uh, temporary and uh, uh, we also said in 2015 that uh, we proposed that uh, uh, there be a defined and agreed upon list of core internet values and these core internet values need to be the reference standard for global internet policy so uh, i wanted to mention this uh, that uh, it is very very important at this point of time to pay attention to how the core internet values are heard and uh, uh core internet values uh, in the words of jolly macfi or uh, something like broad commandments these values are at the core and they are never meant to be changed there is temptation at a point of time like this to alter it in a certain way but whatever alterations are done or uh, temporary so that's all i wanted to say and uh, i would like uh, went or someone to uh bring in their insights on this uh, specific topic before uh, it's closed and thank you thank you olivia uh thank you uh, shiva it's olivia speaking we've got very little time did, did uh, anyone wish to comment on this briefly I note in the chat the internet invariants that Leslie Dago has been speaking about, and I know that the Internet Society has followed up with uh, much discussion on on this topic as well. So oh, uh, it's Vim. I'd like to uh, to respond to uh, Siva's point. Uh, I think we are. I'm reaching the conclusion. I don't know about anyone else that uh, all of the freedoms that we uh, want to apply to these, you know, the core values. of the internet have to be tempered somehow and i think we're learning that uh, that we can't have a completely unconstrained environment because humans don't behave well uh, in environments where there are no guardrails and where there are no norms and so i think that, uh, if there's any lesson to be taken away from the last couple of decades of experience with the internet it is that it needs to have uh, a framework uh in which freedom is tempered by responsibility and where people are irresponsible then it's tempered by ways of enforcing uh behaviors that are uh consonant with the kind of society that we want to live in uh and uh, of course the tension here is figuring out what those uh guardrails look like and how they are enforced Thanks very much for this uh, Vint. I guess that's the words of wisdom for for the end of this topic and we certainly have much more discussion in the the future uh, on that. The last part of this section uh, of this uh, meeting is going to be about a statement that has been drafted by a number of people in the coalition and uh, that's been the effort has been led by Gregory Name who's uh, joining us here. and we also have some members of the other dynamic coalitions that have uh, decided to support the statement gregory over to you to just sh show us through through it i don't know whether you'll share your screen or whether you want me to share the screen uh thank you olivia it would be good if you could share your screen please okay i'll do so okay um thank you everyone for this uh opportunity i suggested this uh statement in order to address uh government behaviors that are detrimental freedom of speech 
we have listed five instances of uh, excessive controls, and uh, especially we call excessive any unilateral control of uh, the internet for political reasons, especially for political purposes. Reason can only exist if human beings are allowed to scrutinize each other. And this applies especially to political life. Every country that is a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has a duty to ensure freedom of speech. But not every country is fulfilling their commitments. As a dynamic coalition on core internet values, we have the duty to express our concerns. Uh, this statement is an appeal to dialogue. It rejects the notion that political control of the internet can be exerted without the participation of stakeholders. Nobody knows everything. No argument is so good that it can dispense with dissent. Freedom of speech is a precondition for mutual understanding. These are the values we defend, and these are values that all UN countries have committed to uphold. The text as such is divided in three main parts, uh, preliminary considerations, problematization, and a call to action. Now to the statement. <clears throat> The internet is architecture as an ecosystem that is free and open, global, decentralized, end-to-end, user-centric, and robustly reliable. As a global network of networks, the internet is a universal medium meant to be open to all, regardless of geography or nationality. Its interoperability makes it possible for any computer system to run application programs from different vendors and to interact with other computers across local or wide area networks, regardless of their physical architecture and operating systems. The internet's technical standards are open standards that enable any device or network to connect to the internet and allow these services and allow diverse services, applications, or types of data. The internet is meant to be free of any centralized control. Its end-to-end -end and user-centric nature gives control to the end users over the type of information, application, and service they want to share and access. The internet is robust and reliable. The internet owes its success not only to the technology, but also to the way it operates, with no single authority directing it, except for its unique addressing system coordinated by ICANN, which is designed for robustness and reliability, and whose policies are developed in an open, multi-stakeholder manner. Internet governance is a multi-stakeholder global process of furthering the evolution of the internet as a universally accessible, global, free and open, interoperable, end-to-end, -end, decentralized, and loosely coordinated ecosystem. The internet is free of barriers to connect, communicate, and create. The IGF in particular is a forum of multi-stakeholder policy dialogue. These so far are the uh, preliminary considerations. Now we are going to the problematization. Recently, unilateral government actions have undermined public trust in the internet as a force for good. Such actions do not reflect an international consensus. Uh, they do not result from dialogue with stakeholders in the communities affected. They are not endorsed by the IGF, the Forum for Internet Governance. Such actions include suppression of political dissent, Despite calls for content moderation in given circumstances, there is no consensus on what constitutes on what constitutes reasonable moderation. On the other hand, there is a consensus that the systematic suppression of political dissent does not qualify as reasonable moderation. National fireworks. Global reach is a core principle of best technical practices. It is built on end-to-end -end communication and interoperability. This principle only works if the internet is shaped with a view to facilitate free interaction among its users and functions as a network driven by the endpoints of communication without censorship or controlled routing. National shutdowns. 
By shaping the internet in ways that lead to fear and confusion in local communities, governments jeopardize international goodwill. If there are security concerns, there are technological ways of finding out what specific target is affected with no reason to shut the entire network down. Shutdowns infringe basic human rights, such as freedom of expression and the rights to information with harmful consequences for people's lives. Fragmentation of the internet. The blocking of internationally available servers to a portion of the users, including the blocking of applications or applying provider discriminatory or content aware or region specific traffic shaping policies causes the fragmentation of the internet. Fragmenting the internet offends the principle that all humans are born equal and therefore must have equal access to any information and knowledge available to mankind. Data politicization and traffic shaping. The internet is a global network of networks. By dictating how networks should connect with each other and by splitting traffic, <clears throat> governments undermine the agility, resilience, and flexibility of the internet. The rules of connection between networks should result from technical rather than political considerations. These are, this is the problematization, and then a short call to action. The undersigned organizations and groups distance themselves from political actions that distort the inclusive and global nature of the internet. We therefore encourage governments to seek democratic legitimation for their policies. This is only possible by engaging in a participatory dialogue with stakeholders. Dynamic coalition and core internet values Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. This is uh, the this, this statement. Uh, as this is an ongoing debate, we welcome ongoing input. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to the drafting, and uh, I very much look forward to further constructive discussions and dialogue on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gregor Gregory. Sorry, Sebastian Bachelet speaking. Uh, I take back the um, moderation of the, of the session. And uh, um, I would like, uh, if, if you have comments, please raise your hands or put a question in the chat. But uh, may I ask if uh, other leaders or leaders of other uh, coalition dynamic coalition would like to take the floor and uh, express your their view on on this uh, document and and um, we are supposed to finish soon i don't remember what time we were supposed but please uh, if there are other uh, people from other Hello. Yes, go ahead. I have the floor, please. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, my name is Noha Bilbeki, and I'm uh, representing the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Uh, we um, are 100% uh, supporting the statement because uh, youth are, are uh, from generation Y and Z are digital natives and are the main users of the internet and they are highly affected by everything that happens online. Um, uh, so during the, during the crisis, we, we um, observed um, many things happening online, like applications uh, are getting blocked in some countries. We, we observed partial and, and sometimes total shutdowns in other countries. Uh, we observed youth getting affected because uh, uh, their education is affected. They, they need to, to study online uh, uh, sometimes uh, as full timers. Uh, um, many youth also, uh, their work got affected because they had to work from home or, or their freelance jobs got affected or their, even their startups uh, got affected by the crisis. Um, uh, uh, also, we observed some political suppression in some countries. Youth were not able to 
express uh, 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 their views or how their governments handle the, the, the crisis or the pandemic situation. Um, so uh, uh, that's why we're supporting the statement because it, 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 uh, it promotes protecting the basic human right of uh, youth or, or any other end or all the end users to, to be online and uh, uh, to protect their online presence. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, uh, very much. Uh, any other dynamic, dynamic coalition who want to take the floor now? It's Vint, uh, could I jump Vint? in? Yes, please go ahead, Vint. Um, I just put something in the chat, but as I listened, it occurred to me that uh, maybe we should uh, take the, as a as a um, as a basis this statement that we just heard uh, from Gregory, and develop a universal declaration of human digital rights and responsibilities. And I note that the universal declaration of human rights did not include the word responsibility, and it strikes me that this would be an important addition to a statement in this digital context. Thank you, Vint. Uh, uh, sure, we will take that into account. And uh, may I give the floor to uh, IRPC uh, representative? Is it uh, Marianne or, or your colleague? Uh, Marianne. Okay, I need to do It's something. either going to be Marianne or Minda, one of. Uh... Okay. Minda is saying, please, Marianne, go ahead. So, and Marianne, please. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? Because, yes. uh, okay, thank you. Yes, yes. I, um, uh, Minda will jump in, I think, if she wants to. Uh, yes, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition supports this statement because, it, as I've noted in the chat, it resonates with the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. I do believe responsibility event is mentioned in the Charter because the Charter includes a note on our corporate responsibility. And I think the Charter encompasses all our, our points here um, very well because it was a collaborative uh, effort 10 years ago now, 10 years ago. And many people in this session were, were actually in some of those early, well, some people in this session were in those very early drafting stages. So I think um, it may be a self-serving argument on the part of this coalition, but I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. We need to get our shoulders behind the wheel that is already turning. And, and we, do this, we do it in this way, by endorsing these kinds of statements. Uh, we may not agree on every single point, but why should we? The basic, the basic principle is there. And I think, um, so I would just... I would just like to note that the Charter has been around it, it is in public domain, and it draws on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, subsequent treaties and covenants, uh, with all their imperfections and perhaps arrogance positions about the statement of humanity, uh, just to refer to um, uh, Deirdre here. So in that sense, that's why the IRPC had a discussion and have basically endorsed the statement. Uh, we need to go deeper uh, and, and have all our efforts uh, resonate more deeply rather than more thinly so if Vint, with all due respect, I feel we already have the sort of document that you're um, advocating. And I think we need to use that and build it out more with these sorts of statements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. Before I, I see Gregory, you wanted to take the floor, but before I give you the floor, may I ask if somebody from the Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things are with us and um, if... Um, wants to take the floor. Oh yeah, I have... Uh, oh, yeah. I don't see Shane, unfortunately. Okay. Shane choose. Therefore, I will give the floor to Gregory and then to Olivier. Gregory, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the comments. Uh, if, there is, if there is a problematic aspect I see and uh, in which I think there needs to be more academic research and more, and more discussion is, uh, Arguably, there can be there can be a conflict of human rights when it comes to things like encryption, because on the one hand you have Article Two, which says uh, everyone has a has a right to security, 
and it can be it can be argued that the state has a right to provide security to every citizen. Therefore, security forces should have access to to encrypted messages in order to in order to prevent some kind of crime to happen. And on the other hand, we have an article on uh, expressly, of course, an article on freedom of speech. But with the internet, we have now situations in which arguably people can people can bring single statements of the of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into conflict with each other. And uh, I, I would suggest that uh, more uh, academic discussion and at all any kind of discussion on how to how to deal with this, uh, I would say, juristic, if not philosophical, ethical problems of communication uh, are needed. And therefore, perhaps uh, some kind of updated version of the human rights in connection, in connection specifically with the internet would be useful, not really in order to add something essentially new to the, to the, to the existing declaration, but to perhaps clarify possible problems and possible situations in which conflicts may arise. Thank you, Gregory. We are at the top of the hour. Therefore, I will um, give the floor to Olivier and I will give him the last words. Uh, he's the last one to talk, whatever you want to say, and we will close the meeting just after. Olivier, please. Last Thank word. you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Olivier Capone, for speaking. And I, uh, I'm going to try and be brief. Uh, first, thanks uh, for all the points that have been made. Um, yes, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition has been working on, on this topic for quite some time. And perhaps, uh, I mean, I, I very much uh, like the fact that we've had um, support from the IRPC for this statement. Perhaps we could also lend a hand and, and try and maybe provide some help to the IRPC to continue the work in the IRPC. I think there's a good opportunity for collaboration. I must uh, say that we've also asked an, a lot of other dynamic coalitions to uh, support this statement. Some were not able to do so because they were a little disorganized ahead of this meeting. It was a little too late for them to jump into this. And they, they, some of them don't even have a process by which they can support or not support an external statement. Some. Um, had some concerns about points of the statement and, and therefore decided to actually not go the way that the IRPC did, where the IRPC said, well, we might not totally agree with some parts of the statement, but we want to support the main parts of it. Some were stopped from supporting any of the statement because of a specific issue in the statement. And perhaps that will bring us some chance for further discussion with these um, with these uh, other uh, um, uh, uh, dynamic coalitions. And I think that's a, a good point. Sometimes we have to disagree on some points. So we will have some further discussions on this in future meetings and future intersessional uh, work. Um, that's pretty much it. There was also a question finally on the chat also about what can the UNIGF family do about these, uh, these vital issues? And of course, Releasing such a statement here as a number of dynamic coalitions is one step. Um, spreading it to uh, for more people to join and to take part in the work is another thing. All of the dynamic coalitions, not just the one on the, the core internet values, but, but the other ones out there need more people to help in the work and more active people to help in the work. And it's only by working together that we can make our voice known further. And um, uh, and get the UNIGF to, uh, uh, to, to give it its full uh, strength. I think that's all I needed to say. We're already uh, late on, on this. I wanted to thank everyone for having attended this call, uh, this meeting, I guess, the first virtual meeting that we do. It's a bit of a pity that we can't meet. Hopefully next year we'll be able to meet again. Uh, and of course, I wanted to thank Sebastian Bachelet uh, very much for having chaired uh, this session did a, a fantastic job. And finally, all of our uh, panelists. First, first, Alejandro, thanks very much for taking us through uh, uh, some great work that, that you've done. Olga, uh, thank you so much for this very interesting insight. Um, and uh, Gregory, of course, for having uh, taken us through, uh, through the statement and uh, helped us uh, all uh, draft on this. If you're not on the mailing list, please drop me a note um, OCL at GIH.com and then we'll add you onto the mailing list of the Dynamic Coalition and I think it's time for us to go uh, to a close. So thank you and thanks of course to uh, our uh, colleagues uh,
Ken Ken and uh, Vincent for having uh, expertly run this uh, uh, this uh, uh, virtual room uh, for us all. Thank you and um, see you all soon. Yes, hello, yes, my colleague, please, uh, you can now, thank you.